Perfect. So I guess we are getting close to 11.05. So this is a good time to get started. Uh, so please welcome Carl Wanwick. So Carl is an MIT alum, you know, then spent some time at Google and then, you know, made his way, you know, to New York to join Columbia University, where he, you know, does a lot of interesting research in computer vision. Now, in his PhD, you know, Carl was one of the brave people who said, I want to predict the future. <laughs> and, you know, he, you know, I think in 2014, 2015, when people were still figuring out how to deal with images, you know, Carl was trying to predict the future, right? And as a famous, you know, you know, quote says, you know, what is really hard to predict, you know, it is the future. So... <laughs> You know, I really like the title of Carl's talk, The Unpredictability of the Future. I'm very excited to hear about it. And, you know, it goes without saying that Carl has won several awards, you know, most recently an NSF Career Award and a Toyota Young Faculty Award. And, you know, his work has been widely covered, including in NPR and even in some children's shows. That is something I didn't know, Carl. So <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's, it's a great way to inspire children to take up computer science. So, you know, with that, you know, I will not hold off Carl from his talk. I'm very excited to have you. Please take it away. Okay, thanks, thanks Paul, Kate, for the very generous uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so thanks very much, everyone, for having me. Um, I was trying to decide what to talk, talk about, um, and I figured I'd just talk about what I'm most excited about right, right now. Um, and um, uh, yeah, this is a project about, you know, the unpredictability of the future. Um, and uh, where this all started really was, um, you know, we kind of just got accidentally curious about some, some, something. And we didn't really know why it would be use, useful, but we just thought it'd be, it just, kind of, just seemed really intellectually really cool and exciting. And so we just started to study it and explore it. Um, and uh, it ended up leading somewhere really, 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 really exciting um, and lots of lot different app applications. That's kind of what I want to, to show you guys now. Um, so um, yeah, so we've been working on this task about predicting the future. Um, a lot of people are working on this task, right? And a lot of self-supervised learning is about, about this, right? Um, basically, how do you take advantage of some intrinsic structure in the data, like it be temporal or spatial, right? Um, and use this as like use this prediction task, and you predict kind of out, out, outcomes as a signal to learn. So the, the task often looks something like like this. Um, you have a, a, a video, right? You have a short video of a person doing something. You want to watch it, and then we have to predict what's going to happen next, right? Hasn't happened yet. We want to predict what exactly is going to have happen next. Um, are they going to handshake? Are they going to kiss? Are they going to hug? Uh, maybe you guys can use the chat uh, and make, make your best guess. Uh, what do you think is going to happen hap hap next? A, B, or C? Okay, two Bs, one C. Come on, it's not, not, it's not a trick question. Okay, a few more Bs. Okay, 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 right. And so they, they're, they're going to kiss next, right? And so we're, you know, in some cases, we're actually pretty good at predicting the future, right? We're, you know, this is just, you know, not very far in the future, you're just predicting kind of a second out, right? But, but sometimes we're actually pretty, pretty, pretty good. And this is what this task is about, right? There's a lot of, lot of benchmarks now in computer vision about this, but how, how can you build these predictive models of human activity? That's what's going to have, happen next. What about this, this video here? Okay, so what about now? What, what, what are they going to do next? Are they going to handshake? Are they going to high five? Are they going to eat? It's not so clear anymore, right? Um, and and this is, um, I think, whenever you encounter any realistic situation, it's really hard to predict the future, right? There's it, it, when we commit to these kind of predefined categories about prediction, it's really hard to decide. There's lots of uncertainty here, right? A lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen, 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 happen next. Um, and so what, what, the question we, we've been looking at lately is, um, you know, there's all those work trying to build these strict models and they often commit up front to what they're trying to predict. You know, some work, for example, tries to predict pixels in the future. They try to generate videos of, of the future. Very hard, hard task. Others try to do this categorization, right? 
But if you get the categories wrong, right, then it's still uncertain. There's still a lot of uncertainty as as as, as right? So what we wanted to do, what we were after here was kind of a more natural representation for prediction, which is if I show this video to you and I ask you just to speak in natural language as to what's going to happen next, you wouldn't give me probabilities in terms of these categories. You'd probably say something in natural language and say, well, they're going to greet each, 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 each other. I don't know what type of greeting exactly they're going to be, going to be doing, but the thing that is predictable here is this, this more abstract category of, 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 of that, that, they're, that they're going to greet. And so this is some work that uh, two PhD students in my group, uh, Didak and, and Rish Rishi, um, have been in, in, in investigating, and they published the first paper on this um, back at the last uh, CDPR. Um, and uh, I just think the work is so 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 cool. The technique behind it is 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 is, is very cool, and I just want to uh, give a quick tutorial on, on how it works um, and show you some of the results. And, and hopefully, if I have time at the end, I'll talk about some additional application applications. So um, I think kind of everyone probably knows this slide, but I want to discuss it just because it's going to be the basis and motivation for everything we're, we're going to do, 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 do next. Um, and, you know, kind of what everyone knows, and in, in, uh, if you're taking any kind of machine learning on a one class or any stats one on one class, what you learn about is a uh, regression to the mean, right? Whenever there's going to be an, an, an uncertainty um, and you have multiple modes and, and the output, what any regression is going to do is it's going to regress to, to, to the mean of the solution. Um, so if we apply this in, in this uh, prediction problem where let's say you have the red frames as input, you get to observe the, the three red frames on the left and your goal is to predict an embedding about the, the, blue, the two blue oof frames on, 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 on the right. Now, of course, there's gonna be uncertainty. So you can't actually predict that true embedding. There's many any possible futures that actually come. And so what you get is, is you get this regression of the mean, right? If you were just to train, some, train up some neural net with an L2 loss, for example, um, you would just predict the, the mean of, of these, 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 these modes, um, which might not correspond to, to, to anything. And so there's a lot of work in machine learning right now that tries to fix this, this problem, right? Dan's, for example, you know, since your adversarial loss, tries to snap one of the predictions to the mode. There's also work in probabilistic models that tries to es estimate the full dish distribution. And a lot of this work often views this regression to the mean as some sort of bug that needs to be, be fixed. Um, and what we started thinking about um, in our work is that maybe this regression to the mean isn't actually a bug. Maybe it's actually a feature. Maybe this is actually a, something I mean, that, that we can take advantage of. Um, you know, we get this natural regression to the mean, and can we actually ex exploit that for some, something? And so um, that's kind of what, what, what we're going to try to do. But in order to actually op operationalize this, we need to change something really basically fundamental about um, how, how we train these neural networks, about the geometry that, that we use to, to train, train them. Um, <clears throat> so most neural networks, and probably most neural networks that you, know, you, you were using, um, we often train neural networks assuming that they're inside of Euclidean geometry. We assume that uh, kind of all, all the different rules that we have you know, I think distances be, be, be things are going to obey the laws of Euclidean geometry. Um, and so what we're going to do actually is we're going to change our geometry, but in order to understand what, what this change means, we need to discuss what makes Euclidean geometry Euclidean. And it turns out the Euclidean geometry is actually only five axioms that you need to, need to assume. These are five really basic axioms. They're seemingly obvious. It's kind of even silly to write, 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 write them down. But if you assume these five axioms, you can prove everything else about about you know, everything you know about triangles and circles and, 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 and squares. Um, and so, what these five axioms are, and I'm going to quickly go over these five axioms because we're going to change one of the axioms to arrive at a different type, type of geometry, um, which is what we're going to use for our prediction um, models. So, the, the first axiom in Euclidean geometry is basically defines what a line set segment is. And it says there is one and only one line segment between two, two, between two, two points, right? So here's two points, pretty intuitive to us. There's only one way to draw a line segment between, okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's so basic. It's kind of funny you have to write it down, but you do have to write it down uh, in order to prove everything about, about you put in general. The second, the second action basically extends this definition to define what a line is. Um, it says that a line segment is, is a, is, or sorry, it says what a line is, is, is um, a line segment can be continuously extend, extended to create a line, right? So what that says is that if you want to define a line, all you need is two, two points, right? This is obvious niche, right? You, you, you learned this in high, high school. 
Um, third axiom basically defines what a cir circle is. It says that to define a circle, all you need is, is, um, is a, a, a center and a, a radius, right? As long as you have a center point and a, and a distance from that center point, that is going to uniquely define one circle. Fourth axiom is so basic, it's even hard, hard to uh, draw a picture for it. Um, the, the, the fourth axiom basically says that all right ang angles are going to be the same. So if you have two right angles, you know that they're going to be exactly the same. The number of degrees is going to be exactly the same. Kind of, it's kind of silly to have to write this down, but you do have to assume this for everything. Right. Now, the fifth axiom is actually really special. Um, and for a long time, um, you know, Euclid and, and a bunch of other mathematicians were trying to prove that you didn't need the fifth axiom because the fifth axiom seemed com complex and seemed redundant. Um, um, and so, what 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 what, what is, is this fifth, fifth axiom? This is the fifth, This is the axiom that we're actually going to change change next. So, in Euclidean geometry, what this fifth axiom says is that, and, and it's a little more complex. So, I think the picture will be help, 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 helpful here. It says that given any straight line and a point not on that line. So, at the bottom here is a straight line and a point that's not on it. The axiom says there's there's one and only one straight line which is going to pass through that point and never intersect. Line. So saying there's only one line I can possibly draw here, right? Um, that is going to go through that point and never in intersect the, the, the first. Um, and so this basically defines what a parallel line line is, right? This, but basically what this axiom is all about is what it means to be parallel, right? And so it seemed redundant, right? For a long time, many mathematicians were trying to show that you didn't need this. People spent their careers on this, right? It just seems like why would you need to assume um, this? It seemed re redundant, right? Um, and you know they're trying to show that just just by assuming the first four, you you arrive But it turns out that the fifth axiom actually is re really important. It's actually really special about about you, you putting geometry. And when you don't assume the fifth, this fifth axiom, you arrive at different types of, of geometries. And one of those geometries is what's called the hyperbolic. Uh, geometry. It has exactly the same further four axioms as, as Euclidean geometry, um, but it changes the, 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 the fifth, fifth, fifth one, something kind of bizarre, right? It changes this fifth S axiom to say that there's actually infinitely many straight lines which, which would go through that point and never intersect the first line. And so this is where we kind of just got curious. This is the point where, you know, when my students and I, we were just sort of reading about this and just it just it just sounded so so interesting. We just had to go learn, learn about it. We didn't really know what, what it would be used useful for for yet. Um, so um, let's just to get a little bit more intuition into the space. Let's try to visualize what's going on here. Um, so on the left um, we have the a diagram for Euclidean space. Uh, this is visualizing the fifth um, act, act axiom. Um, so there's a line and a point on on the line and a point and a line going through that point, right? Um, and the origin of that space is the plus plus sign, right? And like most of the Euclidean diagrams in this, in this Euclidean space, you're actually looking at just a small window, of it, right? You're just looking at a small crop of, of, of this Cartesian. And on the right, we're going to draw the fifth axiom in hyperbolic space. Um, and here in the hyperbolic space, the plus sign is still the or origin, but you're actually looking at the entire space. This, this disk that you're looking at here you're looking at from zero to infinity. So infinity in the hyperbolic space is actually going to be the boundary of that at this. And so if we draw this, this fifth ax, axiom hyperbolic space, we can draw a line or in hyperbolic space, this is called a geodesic. A geodesic is a generalization of, of, of a line. We'll draw a line, we'll draw all point on, on, on that line. Right? And, and in that hyperbolic space, uh, there's infinitely many ways to draw lines that are going to go through that point and never intersect the first. So this, this, you know, this, I, I don't know, if, if you haven't seen this before, I, I think it's just me scratching my head a little bit. This, this, this was, was, was quite odd, odd polish, right? Um, why is this? How, 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 uh, 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 how does is this work? So there's many different models for hyperbolic space. There's, 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 there's at least five um, different ways that we can mathematically represent that bit. Um, one of the most common ones of using hyperbolic space in machine learning is called the Poincaré disk model. Um, it's the most popular one just because gradients are, are the easiest to, to cal 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 calculate here. Um, and in the Poincaré disk, basically what's going on is you have a manifold, which is a hyper hyperboloid, And that's the hyperboloid is shown in, 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 as the blue uh, cone, cone, cone here. 
And so points are going to be living on that hyper hyper hyperboloid, and they're going to get projected to this disk um, um, by uh, from their in 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 angle. Um, and so the reason why um, uh, what kind of what was very interesting about the, about this space, right, is if you want to calculate the distance between things in, 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 in this space, it's not just you can't just cut through this hyperbole. You have to travel along this, this hyperbole, and so this creates a different di distance metric. Um, so the hy hyperbolic distance is shown in the equation on the right here um, between two points A, A and B. This is giving you the shortest path um, be between two points. Um, uh, on the uh, hy hyperbolic ball of disk. And so hyperbolic geometry has been exploding just in recent years in machine lear learning. Um, like, like most good, good ideas, um, it started in NLP. Um, this was a, some work in 2017 at NeurIPS um, by Mikel and Kayla about learning point RA embeddings for, for um, word in, in, in embeddings. Um, just in the last few years, this has come to the CDPR and computer vision community. We had few papers coming out. Uh, the first papers in, in computer vision coming out in, in 2020 about using hyperbolic geometry. Um, and I think it's just going to continue to explode. And so one of the goals in this talk actually is to convince you that this is just a good idea that the community should investigate. It. So one of the, 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 the unusual properties about this hyperbolic space is because you're, everything's being calculated on, 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 on this manifold, geodesics, which are basically lines, ge geodesics and hyperbolic space don't look straight to us. Um, so this is uh, on the right, right? What we're visualizing is a geodesic, which is the shortest path between two, two, two points. And so the shortest way to get from those two points as on this hyperbolic is not to cut straight across as, as, as we would see in the Euclidean plane, but I actually have that slight curve. It looks curved to us, right? Um, and that's, that, that's actually because if you were to take a, a different path, if you, if you were to actually go what we see as a straight line, that would take you exponentially longer to get, get there. Um, now, this is where one, a really interesting uh, property, this is where we started thinking about prediction in, 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 is if you start looking at the hyperbolic space and you think about what it means to take the mean, right? What is the mean of two, two points? Um, and so in hyperbolic space, when you take the mean, it's actually gonna get closer to the or, or, origin. Um, if you have two points and you take the midpoint of them, it's gonna push you closer to the origin. And this was actually a key prop property that we're going to take advantage of when, when, when we build these predictive models. Because we're going, to, we're going to end up building, I think as you can probably predict, we're going to build these predictive models um, in hyperbolic space and leverage some of the properties of, of the space to build better models for predictions. Um, just some more uh, properties about, about hyperbolic space. Um, is that uh, uh, kind of in Euclidean space, you know, you, you learn from a young age that you know, all, all angles of a triangle have to add up to 180 degrees, right? This is something you just, you just don't even doubt. You, you know it has, has to be true. Um, it turns out this is not true in hyperbolic space. In hyperbolic space, all the angles of a triangle have to add up to be less than 180 degrees, um, right? It's a, it's, it's a, 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 a different constraint. Um, and so, um, the, 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 actually, from, from this constraint, you can conclude that it's impossible to have a square or a rectangle in hyperbolic space. <laughs> Those shapes just don't exist in hyperbolic space. There's no such thing as a square. If you lived in a hyperbolic world, well, some physicists actually do think we live in a slightly hyperbolic world, but if, if, if you actually did live in a hyperbolic world, you'd have no concept of a square or a rectangle. It's just not possible for those, those, those to exist because you can't have a four-sided polygon where all the angles are going to be 90, right? You can have a force I apply the volume on where the angles are not, not 90, right? But because of the property, you actually can't have, 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 have this square. Um, circles do, 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 do exist, um, but they just look a little, um, a little odd, right? Um, so on the left is a standard circle in, in Indian space, right? The center looks like it's in the center. Um, and on the right is a circle in hyperbolic space. Um, and this is starting to illustrate actually a property about the density of, 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 of this space. To our Euclidean eye, eyeballs, it seems like the center of, of that circle is lopsided, right? It looks like it's lopsided, but actually that is the center of mass of that cir circle. And this is because in this space, and this is why this space is so interesting, is as you move away from your origin, or, or, or 
the space is getting exponentially more, more, more dense. There's actually more room as, 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 as you move away from your origin. You can pack more stuff in, right, um, as, as you move away from the origin. So those, those red lines, right, is showing the ra radius of, 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 of the circle. Those red lines are exactly, are exactly the same dis distance. Um, those, that's showing the radius, are exactly the same distance away from the origin. So, um, you know, this, this idea of hyperbolic space is really fascinating to people for a long time. Um, um, this is a drawing from M.C. Escher. Um, and what was amazing about M.C. Escher is that he understood hyperbolic space well enough that he can actually draw pictures in hyperbolic space just with a pencil and a comp compass. He didn't need a computer in order to, to, to draw in hyperbolic space. And he created these beautiful tilings. Um, but it actually illustrates an important property about the space. And it, it actually illustrates why some people in machine learning are starting to get excited, excited about, about this geometry. And the, the, what he's showing here, actually, this is a really good illustration now, is that it shows the, um, the basically illustrates the, the density of the space, how you get more space as you move away from New York. So all of these, if you look on the right, you see a bunch of tilings of bats, right? All of these bats, the area is exactly the same. Um, so the area of the big bat in, in the center is exactly the same area as the bat that, you know, it's on the boundary of, of this disk. And that's just because you're getting more, more dense. It's getting more dense, right, as, as, as you move away from the, the boundary. And so it's due to this pro property that actually makes hyperbolic space really good for embedding hierarchies. This is a really use, useful space, really good inductive bias accuracy for learning about hi hi hierarchies. So to, to get more of intuition as to why, why hyperbolic space is good for hierarchies, let's look at Euclidean space and what happens when you try to embed a hierarchy um, in Euclidean space. Um, and here, what this is showing, this is just showing a really sim sim simple tree, right? This is a really simple tree where there's one parent node and three uh, uh, child nodes kind of arranged in a star around it. Um, and but whenever you embed a tree into some sort of in, in embedding space, one property that you really want to have is that the, 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 the geometric disk distance, like the Euclidean distance, for example, should correspond to what the tree dis dis distance is. So for, for example, in the node here on, on, on the far left, right, the tree distance from that node to the node on the top should be two, right? Because you have to travel along two of these, these edge, 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 edge links to get to another, another, another child, right? That's actually what the true tree distance is. But it turns out that if you try to embed this tree, this is the simplest, you know, non trivial tree we can have to illustrate this point. If you try to embed this tree into a Euclidean plane, it's impossible to arrange all the nodes such that the actual geometric distance is going to correspond to what this tree tree distance is. And this introduces this notation of, of a distortion. The distortion is what the true distance is divided by what the geometric distance is going to do of, of the embedding. So the best distortion you could possibly have with the putting space for this type of tree is two over the square root of three. No matter what, what you did, no matter how, much, how hard you tried to arrange these, these nodes, the best you could do is to get these, these child nodes to be square root of three away from each other when you, you actually want it, on it to, to be two. So this is not true in hyperbolic space. Actually, in hyperbolic space, you can embed trees and hierarchies without distortion. Um, uh, and so this is a, a visualization from a paper in 2018 about learning um, hierarchies of words, um, uh, basically learning hier hierarchical word, word, word embeddings. And here they're visualizing a hierarchy of, of these words in the hyperbolic space. Um, and so, uh, it's actually really efficient, right? You can see you can, because the space is getting more dense as you move away from the origin, you can keep cramming more child nodes, nodes, nodes in. And, and the actual geometric distance, right, the hyperbolic distance can be trained to correspond to what the actual tree, tree dis, 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 distance is. And so this is what we're gonna actually gonna do in order to build these predictive models that try to discover abstractions and try to understand what is actually predictable in the future. And we're gonna take, we're gonna, we're gonna basically view uncertainty through a hierarchy. And since that, when you watch this, this video here, it's very hard to say at the atomic level what they're gonna do. We don't know if they're gonna do a power shake, a wet fish shake, a confident shake. We don't know exactly what type of hand, 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 hand shake they're gonna do, 
but we can move up the hi hierarchy and we can hedge our bet, right? We, we can say something more abstract. We can say, I know they're going to greet each other. That is something I'm really confident about, right? I can grip the parent of all the pop, pop, all the possible hand, hand and shapes and say, that's what, what they're going to do, 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 do next. I know they're not going to dance or fight next, right? But they're going to do something about a, a greeting. Um, and so the perfect model I'm going to sh 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 show you now is basically an approach um, to learn not only what activity the person is going to do next, but also select what level of the hierarchy um, it, it should, 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 should predict that. All while not needing us to ever annotate this hierarchy. This is something I love about, about hyperbolic space is it's basically a continuous version of the tree. We don't ever have to um, define what, 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 what this tree is. We, we can, we can uh, have it learn um, what, what this hierarchy is for, for, for the task. So Carl, maybe a quick question. Yeah. So, so if we talk about the Euclidean space, right? if we make it high dimensional, right. then presumably we could still learn the distance. Right? That's right. So, it's, so it's the argument about that given a finite, you know, given the same dimensional space, you know, if it is Euclidean versus hyperbolic, the hyperbolic will fit the hierarchy much better because of the properties it has. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So if you if you increase the dimensionality of, of your space, then Euclidean geometry can encode hierarchies and such that the, the distance will correspond to, to, to the tree distance. Um, so hyperbolic space is especially useful when, when, when the dimensionality is low. Um, okay. One other property, though, of hyperbolic space is that uh, you basically get a dimension. You, 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 one advantage of hyperbolic space is interpretability, which may be a little odd for me to say because hyperbolic space is so counterintuitive. It's <laughs> why is it more, more, more interpretable? Um, but basically, what you get a, a dimen one, one dimension in the space is going to correspond um, to your, your uncertainty. Um, so in Euclidean space, you wouldn't know that. For free, but right? you'd have to figure out once you learn 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 learn, learn, learn your including embedding what direction corresponds to a parent node in the tree. Um, that, that would not be known, known to you right, right away. Hyperbolic space, you actually get that for for free, um, which is I think an, an, kind of an interesting advantage for interpretation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to see going to we're going to build this Pricto model. Um, it's going to be just like a standard predictive model that you've, you've, you've seen in, in, in different works, um, except we're, we're going to be building this in hyperbolic space. Um, and so it's going to be the same setup that we had before, where we have a few frames as input. So the red frames as input. And you want to predict an embed, embedding about the future. So embedding about the blue, blue frames, frames here. You're trying to anticipate an embedding right? about, about, about the future. But of course, there's going to be uncertainty. Right, you, 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 the true future is going to be for this particular video is going to be Z, but there's many possible things that could have happened next. Right, this is a person doing a sports routine; they could have done many different things next. Right. So, what basically this model again by operating in hyperbolic space, basically, we're still going to be predicting the mean of all of, all of, all of these, these these possible out, 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 outcomes. We're still predicting the mean of, of basically all of, all, of, all of these different futures. But the mean here is going to correspond to a parent node inside this hierarchy, right? If you take, if you take the av average of all of these black and blue nodes, it's going to correspond to somewhere around that red, red node where, where Z hat 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 is, right? The mean is going to be moving closer to the, the origin. And so this is how we're going to un 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 understand uncertainty is that there's this dimension, there's this direction in the space, which is the distance from the or 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 origin that tells you how confident you, you are. So the last function we can write down is here. Um, this is uh, just the, this is exactly just the standard contrastive last function that you've seen in many works now. Um, uh, except the only difference is that we're we're, we're doing um, uh, we're changing the distance here to not be Euclidean distance, but to be the hyperbolic disk distance. Um, and so uh, here, basically, you you be you be learning a, a model that can anticipate. The, the representation um, in the future, try to anticipate the, the embeddings in the future. And that's what the first term of this objective function is doing, is it's saying that your prediction should be close to what the, um, the actual embedding of the future is. And the second term is just an example, is just a term for negatives, which is saying 
you know, the, the to prevent a trivial solution where, where both uh, Z and Z hat claps to all always being constant. So the, the second term is just a term for, for negative saying your prediction should be far away from just distractors. Um, and so this is just your standard con contrastive loss um, with a high hyperbolic disk distance. And so you can train this up on, on um, kind of any amount of unlabeled examples that you have. Um, so we, we, we train this up in, in, in video, trying to predict video frames into the future. Um, uh, and it, it basically to learn this, this predictive model um, about what's, what's going to happen next. And so we say this learns the predictability of the future because the model is able to, you know, at, at inference time, automatically select what level of the hierarchy it should be predicting at. If it's really confident about the, the future, the Z hat here can move towards the boundary of the disk. It can say, oh, I know exactly what this person is going to do. But if the model is not confident about, 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 the, about the future, it can basically it can basically move up, up the hierarchy and hedge, hedge, hedge the bet in some ways and predict a, a parent node inside this, this hierarchy. If it's full, if it has no idea, if the model has no idea what's going to happen next, it can predict at the, at the origin, which is kind of the root node of, 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 of this hierarchy, which corresponds to some philosophical you know, action of saying do. Some activity of do it doesn't doesn't really say any, anything precise about what's going to happen. Okay, um, so here's some examples of this this this, this model in act, action. Um, and so this is um, uh, oh I think I have my slide right or let me do the slide first. So um, uh, basically we, we implement this model on uh, 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 there's another approach in, in, in data production that came out from in your existing group called dense predictive coding. It's a really interesting model. It works really well for a bunch of tasks. Um, and basically the way it works is they have a, a you know, they, they feed in some video, they do a convolutional net followed by an LSTM to predict this embedding in the future. And we just made a small change to it. All, all we did is we changed the distance, distance function in this model to be the high hyperbolic distance instead. And so this, this model, um, is this architecture is uh, visualized on the top, up, 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 up here. One actually advantage of this is that we don't have to be operating fully in hyperbolic space. We can we can basically map between the, the two spaces. There's a way to map between hyperbolic and Euclidean space. Um, so we could operate, you know, all these. We could use all the standard kind of model modules from from um, all the different architectures that people are are developed um, to do most of the visual processing, and then just move to the hyperbolic space just for the prediction part. And so that's shown here, where the red is being operating in hyperbolic space, and the blue is operating in Euclidean space. And so you train this whole thing up just, just on um, an unlabeled video, and you get, the, you get this representation that can predict these embeddings into the future. future. Uh, in order to actually interpret what, what these embeddings are, we need some way of decoding it or reading out this, right? We need a way of, of decoding. This is kind of a standard thing in self-supervised um, learning now, right? Is you train these embeddings, you do representation learning on unlabeled data, and then you fit a classifier to it in order to for some down down some tasks that you have. And so we, we actually we have followed all the same paradigm. It's a little bit more complicated in our case because we're not operating in Euclidean space. So our, our classifiers can't just be linear classifiers now. They have to be hyperbolic linear classifiers. So you have to build a linear classifier in hyperbolic space. Um, but it can be done. There's 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 there's, there's been in, in some work. This is um, basically uh, defining a linear classifier in hyperbolic space and showing how, 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 how you can do it. And so you can basically use a little bit of labeled data um, uh, to train classifiers in the space in order, in order to um, uh, predict, right? Uh, actually, read out what, what, what these predictions correspond on to. Um, and so here's one, one example of, of this. Um, this is uh, basically an example of at testing time, a video it's not seen before, where you in, in input a video, uh, video frame sequentially into the model. And it's being trained to predict what is the last action that this, 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 this um, athlete is going to perform. So at the very beginning here, when you all you have is a single frame as, in, as input, um, the model is not very confident as to what, what, what this person is going to do. And so it makes this prediction as relatively close to the or, origin hyperbolic space. So that's shown in the second row here. Right? It produces a prediction um, at, a, at the radius in this point, Ari, Ari ball, is only about 0.85 away from the, the origin. Um, and what that corresponds to in, in, in this model is it corresponds to a, a parent node, right, in, in this hierarchy of action actions. And so the model can say, only confident thing you can say is that the person is going to do some routine with the uneven bars, but can't say exactly what, what routine they're going to do. 
And as more data comes in, right, as, as more frames arrive, right, the, the confidence is going to increase. And that's what you see here with this, this bar chart going down, right? The, it's basically moving away from the origin of the politics. It's increasing confidence. It's going down the tree and producing um, uh, more, 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 more atomic uh, nodes. And so once the second uh, clip arrives here, it's, it gets further away and actually is able to move down the tree and say, oh, they're doing the sort ripples routine, um, which, which is part of the uneven bars, but that specific routine they're going to do it. Until the very end here, where you can see as it gets, as it basically have seen most of the video, uh, it can basically get the answer correct and say they're doing the giant circle back, 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 backwards routine. Okay, so we have applied this on a couple of different data, 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 data sets. Um, here's just some more examples of, of this. This is a two layer hierarchy working on mo movies. Um, so the movie will play in the top left. Um, the, below the movie is going to be the Poincare a, a, a disc. Um, so you're going to see the distance from, from the, the or, origin. Um, that plot is going to fill in, and you're going to basically see it get moved further away from the origin as more frames arrive. And the right is going to be showing the tree, um, and basically where in the tree it's, it's, it's predicting, or what level it's predicting at in the tree, and also what node within the tree is predicting at. Um, so here at the very beginning, it doesn't know what's, what's going to happen. So all it knows is there's some person to interact with the car. Um, and as they, uh, you know, eventually once they see the car door open, it can snap and predict and say, uh, they're going to be getting out of the car. That's actually what's going to happen, happen, happen next. Um, here's another example, a little more complex hierarchy. This is a three layer hierarchy now. Um, this is working on the Olympics. <coughs> um, and so it's the same setup here. So I'll play the video. So in the very beginning, all I can say is balance beam. It's, it's very confident balance beam is going, to, is going to happen. So we're keen about that. It doesn't know what about the balance beam is going to have happen next. Um, and once the person does that, that, that flip, it can say, well, they're going to do balance beam, leap, leap, jump, hop. That is very confident now. So right? it knows within that routine, this is what's going to have, 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 have happen, right? Um, and as more, more and more frames arrive, it eventually can be more and more specific. You can move down this high hierarchy. Um, and actually say, well, the exact routine is going to happen is that, that they're going to do split jump. This is the routine that, 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 that they're doing. Uh, here's another example. Uh, so here they're doing uneven bars. Doesn't know what type of uneven bars the person is, 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 is doing um, until more frames arrive. And it switches uneven bar cir circles. I think, it gets, I think it's actually wrong here. It says transition flight. Um, and we can back backtrack though. So this model can actually then back backtrack and go to the and say, Oh, they're going to do giant circle back, back, backwards. So I think it's, it's actually pretty interesting because it's the, rather like so many of these crypto models that you see in, 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 in the community right now are basically committing up front to what to predict, right? And this is adapt, adaptive, right? This is this model is actually adaptive to different different in, in, in certainties. When it's confident, it, it can it can move down the hierarchy. When it's not confident, it, it can move up 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 the hierarchy and predict something at a more abstract um, level. Uh, so, yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe I missed this, and you told about this. So, what incentivizes the model not to predict the topmost level, right? Because uh, it could always be correct. If that's a correct. great, great question. Question, right? So, this is a common problem in machine learning: is we want our ability for the model to say, "I don't know," right? Um, and whenever we try to do that, we we often it just learns to predict this trivial solution of always saying, I, I, I don't know, right? So why is it not always saying, I, I don't know here? Um, and what I think it's actually been interesting advantage of this approach is that there's no threshold for us to tune. There's no, we don't have to set some hyperparameter about what I don't know, no means. Um, and it's all, all, all basically due to this contrastive objective. This, this objective has two different terms, terms here. The, the first term basically prevents what, what you're saying from happening. It is trying to pull the prediction Z hat here to be as close as pop, 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 pop possible to what the true future is. So it, it is, you know, there's a term trying to pull the prediction to as close to the ground truth as it can. And basically that prevents this, 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 um, this kind of trivial solution of always saying, I don't know. Um, uh, but because there's gonna be uncertainty, whenever there's gonna be uncertainty, the optimal so solution to minimizing this first term is going to be to predict the, the mean of, of all, 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 all the different no, no, modes. And so this is why it's moving up the hierarchies because it's basically predicting the, 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 the mean of, 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 of the, the, the modes. 
Does this answer your question, Pocket? Yeah, so, so I guess because the tree gets structured in the way you were describing earlier, that the center, like the topmost node is in the center somehow. So if you average things off your leaf nodes, you end up moving closer to the center, which is why it is making right. predictions upwards without having any explicit constraint. Exactly, exactly. Because it, 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 if it, basically, if, if the model were to predict at, at the center here, which is saying, I don't know, Right. If it were to break out the center, saying I don't know, that wouldn't minimize the loss because it could yeah. it could minimize it more by moving closer to the actual mean, right? Um, and and then then are we assuming that the videos have been labeled with their finest categorization in the data set? Or yeah, that's all, that's also a great, a great question. I've, I've lost over, over, over this. So you, you can train this whole thing with just unlabeled examples. Um, and then you need some label examples to fit the class, class, class classifier. So um, basically, you need some labels for each level, for each node in the tree that you want to class, 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 class classify. So you need some label examples for each node, but you don't have to know the hierarchy. So I, I don't have to know whether an, 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 an apple is, 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 is a fruit or a fruit is an apple. I don't have to know the direction, basically, of anything in the hierarchy. But I do need some examples of what an apple is, of what a fruit is, right? Uh, in order to fit this class classifier. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, so we find this on a, on a bunch of different benchmarks, um, kind of, you know, the story, but, uh, have, basically the, the key comparison here is whether hyperbolic space is given advantage to Euclidean space um, and a, on a bunch of different bench, bench, benchmarks and depending on how you compute the metric, you know, um, you, that's what, what we see is that hyperbolic space actually provides this advantage over Euclidean space for prediction. Um, this goes back to an earlier question in Polka, I think you had about um, the dimensionality of, of the space. This is visualizing a different data set now um, with the results, but we're also showing results as you change the dimensionality of our embedding. Um, so here the uh, plot is showing uh, in the left, Lighter color is showing the performance when you have 256 dimensions, while the darker color is showing the performance when you have 64 dimensions. Um, and so what you should see here is that when the dimensionality is large, you know, the advantage of hyperbolic space is, is, is small, right? There's, there's, there's only you know, a, 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 a small, small gain. But when the dimensionality is really small, when you're seeing you require this compression, there's hyperbolic space still basically doesn't drop in performance much. And there's actually a huge, huge a huge gap. Um, all right, so you can see that switching from two fixed dimensions to 64 dimensions, there's basically a few, few percent drop in hyperbolic space. While in Euclidean space, there's this huge drop, right? We're often kind of almost 10, 10 points, right? Uh, just by making, making the, the, the dimensionality small. Um, and so here's, here's the final um, visualization of this I wanted to show, which I think shows basically how it's a little more intuition this model. Um, this is trying to visualize the, the trajectory that the model takes in hyperbolic space as more frames come in. So the video here is basically the, the friction in the embedding space as, as more and more frames arrive. Um, uh, and you can see basically what's happening is it's getting closer and closer to, 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 to the boundary of, of, of the disk. Right? It's moving through the space and getting more and more, and more confident um, as a, 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 a additional frames come, come, come in. Okay, uh, so I think I have about 10 minutes left, is that right? Uh, yep. So then I guess on the last thing is I just wanted to talk about another application of, of this we, um, that we've been exploring. I also think it's really exciting. Um, and I wanted to briefly mention, mention it. Um, uh, kind of, we, we've, been, you know, we've been working on these perfect models and we've been really interested in all the different ap applications of, of, of them. Um, and uh, I just want to show you, show you one that I, I thought was, was, was pretty neat, um, which is about this problem of robustness. Um, and I think this is a, uh, basically a, this problem kind of undercuts a lot of different um, AI problems today, right? But we, we have these models that are vulnerable to ever so examples. They, they don't generalize well when you have some added dis distribution. So at the bottom is uh, examples from object net data set actually created at, at MIT, right? Um, which is where these models fail a lot once the NCG up or outside of the, the, the distribution. Um, and so there's been a ton of focus in the field about you know, trying to improve the training algorithm, right? Um, 
you know, there's been like adversarial training where you look at the data, you try to like perturb the training data. There's been some regularization approaches where you try to improve some sort of add constraint to the training process. There's been like, what's the task? What is the right task that you, that you, 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 you can use? So this has kind of been a really well-studied area. Like how do you improve the training process? process? Um, and one thing we've been looking at is actually how to instead improve the inference process. There's a way that we can shift the burden of robustness um, into the inference instead. Um, and basically, the, 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 the main idea here is that at test testing time, all of this self-supervised structure, so like the temporal structure in a video or the spatial structure in the image, that is still going to exist. And that's actually some structure that you can leverage in order to improve um, uh, your, your rec recognition or improve, improve your, your, your pr 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 prediction. Right? This is um, free data, basically. Uh, kind of intrinsic structure to images and video that we can use to improve robustness. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I think everyone knows adversarial attacks, which is you take an image and you can find some very small amount of noise that you can add to the image, which causes the classifier to get it completely, completely wrong. Um, and what's interesting about this, this kind of intrinsic structure to images and video and this friction task is that we can actually use this. This is some work that some students in my, in my group showed, Chengji and, and Nia showed. Is that you can actually use this, this, this kind of this, this temporal or, or spatial structure to create these counterattack vectors. So you can try to reverse the attack, right? So just as an adversarial attack tries to find an additive perturbation that causes the classifier to fail, we can find an adversarial um, perturbation that causes the attack to fail, right? So you can try to basically subtract away um, what, what, what the ad, 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 adversarial. Uh, this is challenging to do, though, at testing time because we don't have access to labels, right? There's no labeled um, data here. Um, and so instead, we can actually use prediction, right? We can actually use prediction as a signal um, uh, uh, in, in order to find these, these re reverses and improve um, in, in, inference. Um, so here's an example of kind of a, um, this is a, one of the, the author's dogs. Um, right, and so there's in computer vision, everyone knows about contrastive learning and this, this, this sim inquiry model, which basically, you know, uses spatial structure, spatial prediction, basically, um, in, in, in order to learn um, embeddings from self supervision. Super, 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 super so what this objective says is when you take two crops from the same image, they should be embedded close in, in, in the embedding space. When there's an adversarial attack, which I think is interesting, it's kind of a worst worst case uh, scenario. Kind of when you use binary systems in the worst 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 case. What's actually pretty interesting is that these adversarial attacks also collaterally in, 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 in impact these, these contrastive uh, 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 embedding. So if you take the same crops and you embed embed them in, in, into the contrastive space, they're now going to be far away, even though the model has been trained to make them as close together as possible. So this, this gap actually in the contrastive space creates this incidental signal at test test time um, that we can use in order to try to reverse these attacks and actually repair these, these models to make the inference more, more robust. Um, and the way you basically do this is you launch the same thing, you launch the same type of objective that, you, that an attacker would, would do to, 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 to destroy the images. But now you're basically trying to find the adversarial perturbation, the small perturbation XR here that is going to cause the self-supervised loss to be restored. So you're trying to find an adversarial perturbation that causes the self-supervised objective to, to, to be restored. So the LS is actually going to be, going to be close, close to each other. Um, one thing that, one reason I'm actually really excited about, about this um, is that we were able to analytically um, uh, 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 study this, 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 this process and we could show that this creates a lose-lose situation for the attacker. So kind of using self-supervision at test test time um, strictly improves your, your performance. Um, and the full argument is in the paper. I probably don't have time to go into the full um, our, 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 our argument here. But basically what, what, what hap happens is that um, when you, when you uh, do, do this kind of reverse attack, when you use self-supervision uh, to, to re re reverse the attack, it causes the attacker to need to solve a multi-objective problem, which is just fundamentally harder to solve than a single objective problem. So this creates a Pareto frontier, and no matter where you operate on the Pareto frontier, um, it's going to be a lose-lose situation for, 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 for the attacker. 
Um, yeah, so anyways, we just continue to be excited about predict prediction. Um, you know, we've been exploring kind of some applications of this in robotics too. Um, this is some work with our, our collaborators in mechanical engineering and robotics about trying to build these predictive mo models for the robot's body to anticipate how its own body is going to look in the future, um, which we can use for, for planning. Um, this is some work that's, that's under review, hopefully going to be published uh, soon. Um, where it uses kind of a, a model itself, it learns a pretty model itself that it can then use in order to plan around op 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 obstacles in order to go, um, you know, do, do do some 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 basic tasks. Um, and one thing that's actually interesting about this pretty model is we see some advantages with ro robustness too. So you, even if the robot becomes damaged, or you take off a, a kind of an arm, or you take off a joint or something, right? Um, uh, it's still it's able to actually learn on mathematically to, to re repair itself, um, which I think is really interesting, right? This is a really interesting advantage of where building these crypto models can be useful for planning, but also can be useful for robustness and repair. Um, so anyways, um, I'm gonna wrap, wrap up here. Um, there's really three main takeaways I wanna leave everyone with. Um, uh, one is that, you know, this regression to the mean is, is often viewed as a bug, but I think it actually can be a feature, right? It's actually a way to, to figure out Abstractions, right? Um, I think this is a, a very important problem in your vision, um, um, and uh, you know, can basically learn what one is predictable, right? Rather than just committing up front, right, to what, what we should predict, um, we should actually learn learn, learn that. Uh, second takeaway is I think hyperbolic maze. I'm just really excited about. Um, it provides new opportunities for modeling hierarchies. So you know, hierarchies appear everywhere in computer vision. They appear everywhere in robotics. They appear everywhere in NLP. It's just a a, a, a good idea. Um, and what I love about hyperbolic stuff is that it's continuous and you can calculate the gradient of, 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 of everything. So I think a lot of people have gotten a bad taste in their mouth about hierarchies because you spend forever debating ontologies and you end up debating right, is, a, is a, um, a hot dog a sandwich or not. Right? You debate these three things forever. And what's so interesting about hyperbolic stuff is that we don't have to debate that anymore. We can actually learn these hierarchies because we can backprop through the whole process. process. Um, so I, I, I remain kind of very optimistic that these hyperbolic things is just a good idea that we're going to see um, uh, just explode um, soon. Um, and um, as well as, you know, the last takeaway here is I think prediction is a really, really interesting signal. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work at using this for learning representations, um, but it's also useful for, for, for inference, right? Prediction is available and the, the failure to predict is actually a signal that's still available at test, testing time. Um, and so we can take advantage of that. So with that, I'll wrap up. Happy to take any additional questions. Um, and thanks so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Carl, for the inspiring talk. And you know, let's also thank Tao, who you know helped host this seminar. Uh, with that, uh, we have time for a few questions. So anyone from the audience has a question? Ruman. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, the videos and uh, the certainties of the embeddings. Uh, yeah. So we currently saw in the examples that you gave is that the certainty always increases. Uh, I'm curious what's going to happen if we have some adversarial setting where, for example, suddenly uh, we start a new video that's completely different from the, from the one that we've been watching so far and how the uncertainty changes. Um, is in general, do we have any guarantee that the embeddings are going to become more and more certain, uh, or is that some implicit uh, thing that comes into the loss function? Thanks. Yeah, that, that, that's a great, a great, great question. Uh, there's no guarantee, and I think that's a, a good thing. It actually can back backtrack, um, so it can get less certain over, over time. If something unusual happens that there's anomalies actually can back, back backtrack, and the reason why is because this. Objective all it's trying to do is, is get as close as is trained to try to get, get its Z its Z hat to be as close to what is it actually going to in, in, in reinforce, right? Um, so it's able to learn basically when 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 to back 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 off. Um, we saw some examples in this video here where that's not quite what you're saying, but I think it illustrates the, the same point is it moves down the, the path and it actually gets it wrong, right? It makes the wrong it's the wrong prediction at the leap node. And it's able to go, go back and go down a different path. So here it predicts transition flight, which is wrong. And it's, once more data comes available, it's going to switch back down to down, down a, a, a different path. Um, so. Thank you. Thanks, Cyrus. Hi, um, Carl. Thanks for a great uh, talk. So I have a question on the applications. 
So have you considered uh, applying your models to the domain of autonomous driving? So for instance, like predicting future behavior for like uh, traffic agents becomes like a very important question in this domain. So do you have any thought on that? So what are some of the challenges uh, on applying your model to this domain? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's also a great question. Um, and we've been talking about different ways of, of doing this autonomous driving. Um, the hyperbolic representation is really good for semantic hierarchy. So this is for a, 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 a action prediction. So you know that does come from autonomous driving, right? Like what is activity is personally doing? But I, I, I'm not sure hyperbolic space is the right embedding for trajectory prediction, right? If you want to represent the trajectory a person's going to indicate. Um, there's other types of geometries that might be better suited for, for that, um, particularly the Wasserstein um, distance might, might be a better approach. We've been looking at different ways of doing that, but nothing con 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 concrete yet. Um, <clears throat> cool, thanks. And I guess we have a question from Akash, maybe the last one. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. It's really amazing. Um, I have I have simple, very simple questions. Like, how do you actually pick the time um, slice for um, you know what becomes the mean and what becomes the sort of the engine bedding? And in that sense, like, is there a generalization of this to static images? I mean, like, as humans, we can make some some decisions just by looking at the last. Because you were, um, if you pause the last figure, we can also make and the related question to that is, then what about the uncertainty, uncertainty quantification? Is there a sort of, a, I'm just wondering, this, this kind of, this system should have an amazing way of um, quantifying the uncertainties of the predictor. And I, I wonder if you looked into it, that would be pretty useful. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. So one, I guess I'll go in reverse order. Uh, yeah, so there's this question of like, is there a way to map these representations of uncertainty to some probability, right? Um, and we've been, we've, we haven't seriously looked at that much, but um, we've been exploring different ways of, of doing that. It's sort of unclear. We're not actually sure if there's a, a rigorous way of making that, that map, mapping. There's other types of geometric embeddings that do make this rig rigorous. So, and those are equivalent to hyperbolic spaces. So it seems like there's some, you know, winded, long winded argument we could try to make to map it back, back, back to a, a, a probability. But I think what I remain excited about this more is that this is a more natural representation of uncertainty for, for or more intuitive representation for pe people, right? Like rather than a person saying, oh, the coin's going to be 50% heads, they, they would hedge the bet and say, I don't know what the details, but I do know it's going to land on the floor, right? Um, and so that's what I think is an interesting advantage here. Um, I forgot the first question actually you had. Um, uh, just how do, how do you split this uh, you know, the, the red part from the blue part? Is there is there something you're when oh. you're creating the model? Yeah, yeah, that's just kind of a hyper hyperparameter. Um, we we ended up just building off of um, this paper dense predictive coding from Andrew Zisman's group, um, where they had picked the hyperparameters, and we just kind of made a one line change to, to their code to do the hyperbolic distance instead. Um, so yeah, that's a hyperparameter you you can pick. This is a recurrent model, so um, in some ways, it should be a little robust at hyperparameter because it, it's basically feeding in one frame at a time and making a friction each time time step. Thanks. Yeah, I think we are a couple of minutes beyond noon, so let's thank Carl once again. Thanks so much, much everyone, uh, and I'll be around uh, tomorrow to uh, chat, chat more, 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 more too. Well, yeah, we're looking forward and thanks, Carl, once again for making the time. No, thanks so much for